again and uh, welcome to Word Wednesday and we want to thank you for being part of uh, these conversations that we've been having here specifically about uh, the Gospel of Mark and we started out from chapter 1 and now we're going all the way uh, we've gone all the way and we are now at chapter 7 so we'll be looking at chapter 7 and 8 specifically some of the interesting highlights uh, that we find in um, uh, the chapter 7 and chapters uh, uh, chapter 7 and 8 and uh, so as we begin our time uh, let us pray Again, loving God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to engage in your word. It is your word, and no one else can explain, explain it to us apart from you. And we ask, O oh God, that the Holy Spirit shall be with us as we engage this word, your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are uh, uh, chapter seven. Uh, lots of things, uh, Pastor David, uh, that we are gleaning from the Gospel of Mark. And uh, one of the things I observe is that Jesus uh, rarely talked directly to the people. Uh, Jesus largely talked to the leaders, specifically the spiritual leaders. Um, and uh, it seems, if you are to talk about beef, you know, <laughs> it seems like the big beef uh, was he had was with the leaders. And uh, uh, he was very outright about uh, correcting them and not in a very, you know, sometimes in a very harsh way, right? Uh, when he talks to, about the, when he talked to the people, he mostly talked about faith. But when he talked about to the leaders, he talked about failure, like total failure. And uh, in terms of leadership, when you think about that, uh, he really was emphasized, emphasizing on the value of leaders mm. and how leaders determine the direction of the people, such that sometimes you would not quite blame the people uh, for where they are at. Uh, there's a big part where when the leaders are intentionally wrong, mm. then they are to blame for the, uh, for the status of the people. And that's what seems to be here. And uh, chapter 7 starts right again with Jesus uh, talking to the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And these were um, spiritual leaders. And uh, Pastor David, it's kind of strange uh, because we always would expect that spiritual leaders will be, will be the leaders of light. But it seems here they were leaders into some form of darkness. You look at um, <clears throat> what you have said is exactly spot on. Because Jesus had something we may call a counterculture. Because in our normal circumstance, we speak tenderly to the leaders with respect and with awe sometimes to the leaders. And then we shout at the people and tell them this is what you need to do. But Jesus was the, does the opposite. He speaks tenderly to the people and then very strongly to the leaders. Because he understands that if the leaders get it right, then the people will actually... Uh, you know, will actually walk right. Because he's, uh, I mean, if you found sheep, you know, a bounce of sheep somewhere in the middle of the, of, the, of the forest, most probably it is not the sheep that are an issue, but the shepherd. Mm -hmm. He's the one who led them right there. So shouting at the sheep is not helpful. But then the, the, the leader, watch how you go. Watch what you do. It will be helpful because next time when he's right, the sheep or the followers will be right. So Jesus makes sure to talk to them. But now the spiritual leaders, the reality is uh, there have always been that uh, kind of mirroring that when you have a bad leadership in a country, you find that the spiritual leadership is actually skewed towards that kind of direction. So if the country is going the wrong way, don't just look at the president and the political leaders, look at the spiritual leaders. They could be actually the ones who have started the fall. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I was thinking a, a lot about, in the course of the week, uh, I've been thinking about Jesus and miracles. Uh, and we've seen quite a bit of miracles, and we have some more miracles in chapter 7. And I was wondering, why was Jesus doing miracles? And many times we would want to think that, um, which is okay, that Jesus was doing miracles because he could, uh, to show his power and also to show his stature that he is God. But then I was also thinking, um, on the other hand, because most of the miracles had to do with health and they had to do with food. 
mm. and it seems like the healthcare system and uh, the food system uh, and of course of taxation as well was a was a big factor in the in the story of Jesus but it seems he was already almost moving the miracles are were, were an emergency note they they were showing how urgent uh, the these systems need to be fixed the food system the 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 food system the health system broken down and how much they needed to be fixed at the same time you find that uh, these were areas where these teachers of the law these spiritual leaders uh, were directly involved and they there's something they could have done about it right there's something they could have done about it but uh, Jesus had to come you know to do miracles you know in place almost replacing in place of a system that should have done exactly what Jesus was doing. I, I actually was feeling sometime uh, as if uh, uh, the system should have done miracles of its own, you know. <laughs> but because the, the system had not done its responsibility, then it, miracles had to come in uh, to, you know, stabilize and give hope to the people. <laughs> that reminds me um, when I was a student, and I used to say, if you don't read piecemeal, you require a miracle during the exams. And if you don't work for it, when time comes, now you should have done something. But now there's a point where only a miracle can help you. And you see, that's exactly it. That every system were broken down. The priest where actually says that this this woman had actually gone to many physicians. Mm. And she sounds like a normal Kenyan going to India. I mean, if you find a Kenyan who has done a fundraiser going to India, they will tell you, we went to many physicians. There has come to a point where we want to go to India. Mm. And at that point, maybe at the airport is where Jesus would show up and say, you know, how many years have you suffered? The first time I had this symptom was this day. Say, you don't need India any longer. Go and sin no more. Mm. Your sins are forgiven you and you are totally healed. Your faith has made you well. Yeah, your faith has made you well. Because you have faith, you get healed. Otherwise, 4.5 million is a lot. But since you have faith, <laughs> you get well, this is done. So, if the system is not working, and you have said another thing about food, and food is big in Jesus' ministry. It's something I think we can talk for long. We talk about food. Even the Last Supper, which is what was passed on uh, to the church, even to the present day, has to do with food. It's food. Even heaven is a feast. We are waiting for heaven, the big feast. Actually, Jesus calls himself the bread of life. And it's, it's fascinating that if we read in the local language, one of the local languages here in the country, uh, it talks about itahari amuel, and itahari is just one serving of, of, you know, of mokimo, that is enough to feed an adult. So Jesus is, is able to satisfy us. So he identifies himself as food that satisfies. Mm -hmm. And so when he does these miracles, he keeps on saying, I'm the bread, I'm the bread. But again, food is so basic. When it comes even to missions and ministry, you can't preach to hungry people. You can't, you know, you can't come and say, be warm to hungry people. So Jesus again met that issue of food and continued to pick that idea and made sure that everyone who met him was satisfied physically so that the spirit again would be satisfied. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let's just hear the first verse. Let's read the, the first two verses of chapter 7. Uh, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. Now they are the Pharisees, they are teachers of the law, and they had come all the way from Jerusalem and they were now gathered around Jesus. You can tell there was an agenda there. Uh, and they saw, now this is what I really want us to engage a little bit. Let's leave those Pharisees and teachers of the law for, teachers of the law for a little bit and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And there's a bracket there saying, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, 
and kettles, all that. Now, what catches my eye are the disciples here who are themselves Jews, <laughs> right? <laughs> who themselves understand the traditions of the elders, who know the consequences, you know, of uh, such kind of, uh, uh, I mean, defiant behavior. But they actually go ahead and eat food with hands that had not been washed. Now, when I think about this, this is one place where I see as if the disciples were getting it right. You know, Mark is about the disciples not getting it right at all. They were getting it wrong each time. But in this one instance, they took a daring thing. They departed from the culture of the present at, at a great risk. They were actually um, trying to get themselves a new identity. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's interesting. You know, they were trying to come up with a new tradition. They were trying to um, say, no, we can eat this, which was very, what we can say um, uh, counter culture of that particular time. And I wonder what they were feeling because when you're used to do things in a particular way and then uh, you begin a new tradition and uh, this tradition threatens you. It's not one that uh, makes you, you know, you could say that the Jews and people are washing with a particular kind of, in a particular style or they were washing with a particular soap. But now disciples come with a new way of washing and a new soap. No, no, no. They are actually are not washing at all. And uh, that's uh, when I think about that, and I'm like, I mean, these are people who are already beginning to sense, to question the traditions of the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And under the cover of Jesus, because they had seen, of course, him do a few miracles, they knew that he would, you know, take care of them. But I like the fact that they already are beginning to get out, you know, and to challenge the traditions of that particular time. Mm. At this point, uh, um, now the disciples are beginning to get it in terms of now they have worked with Jesus long enough they know what you would do in such a situation and they do it boldly because the idea is to walk with Jesus so closely understand him and begin to do like Jesus ask yourself what would Jesus do and they knew Jesus wouldn't go for the ceremonies of washing of hands they would, he would go there to the meal they did exactly that and that's a call to us. Because sometimes we are so stuck with traditions. I was just thinking the other day, the way I saw somebody drop a Bible. And, and they cast as it fell. And they were very, you know, they felt so bad about the Bible falling. They forgot they, they cast as they did that. So they are breaking the law inside the Bible, but they don't want to drop the Bible. So these fellas are, are doing traditions and washing hands. But the kind of things they do against the God who they are supposed to honor by the laws is so great. But the fellas who are not washing hands are actually following Jesus closely. They have accepted his son. Therefore, are following what God would rather, you know, would have them do rather than doing the traditions of men. And uh, the traditions are well labored. They are the traditions of the elders. Now, notice mm. that. So the elders were powerful. Mm. They had a whole set of, uh, uh, of ways of life that were supposed to be fulfilled by the people that had a tag, their tag on them. These are the traditions of the elders. Mm -hmm. And then of course the, the Pharisees and teachers of the law uh, themselves come in with a question and they say, no, no, no. Your people are eating food with defiled hands. And so they are already finding fault with not just the disciples, but with Jesus, who is their, their lead. Mm. And, uh, I mean, shock on them, because Jesus gives them a rejoinder. <laughs> they thought, we've got you. You know, this is a clear law. But Jesus goes all the way to Isaiah and calls them uh, uh, hypocrites. Mm. Hypocrites. Can you imagine? I mean, I'm trying to imagine. I'm here in the church and uh, I'm teaching and all that. Then somebody says, you know, you are such a hypocrite. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, you know, this is a boom. Like, ooh, what's going on? You know, so I can imagine now the Pharisees and teachers of the law uh, being called hypocrites here. It really first uh, took them by surprise. And then they also went personally that Jesus is attacking us. But that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He was attacking them and he was telling them, I can see right through you. I can see right through you. And uh, uh, and he told them something very significant uh, in verse 8, that you have let go 
of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions, something which caused us, especially as a church, to always make sure that we draw the line clearly. And we can say, these are the commands of God, and these are the denominational traditions. And not to ever at one point elevate the traditions over the word of God, or emphasize on the traditions so much that the traditions, pastor, become our identity, yeah. instead of the commandments of God becoming yeah. our identity. That, that's the reality. Again, because it's it's a very, because human traditions and uh, uh, traditions of elders and denominational traditions are normally very appealing because they are man-made. And when they are man-made, they actually appeal not to the members, they appeal to the leaders. So it is the leaders that actually feel powerful through the traditions because they are the ones who can tell you you are wrong. But so, you know, God's word, when God's word corrects you, it's God correcting you. But when a tradition corrects you, it's man correcting you, and they feel nice correcting you. So again, that is a warning to all of us, and we shouldn't elevate them, the traditions beyond the word of God. But the truth is, if you look at our denominational lines, uh, when I say, for instance, I'm Anglican, mm. what do I mean? Am I talking about the commandments of God no. or the traditions of man? <laughs> if I say I am Catholic, Am I talking about commandments of God or am I talking the traditions <laughs> of men? If I say I'm Presbyterian, am I talking the commandments of God or am I talking the traditions? If I say I'm Pentecostal, am I talking about, you know, the commandments of God or am I talking, you know, the traditions that we have? Now, I would say, and I would put it uh, from observation, that most of the Christian identity today, especially when it is, where it's denominational, it is actually um, it's actually out of traditions. Mm. So we denominations are actually named after traditions. And so we should be very careful when we are calling ourselves, you know, uh, uh, you know, like um, calling ourselves calling our identity as Christians is pegged on the denomination. We should be very, very careful because that's where you be, you begin not to not to identify yourself with God so much, but with traditions on the other. So we should be very, very careful. Some people may say it's inevitable. Some people may say, I mean, these are all different revelations, but uh, we should, the, the, the caution out there is that yes, you are Presbyterian. Yes, you are Anglican. Yes, you are Catholic. Yes, you are AIC. Yes, you are Pentecostal. Yes, you are Salvation Army. Yes, you are, you know, um, uh, all those denominations. But remember, that should never be your core identity. Your core identity should be that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and we follow the commandments of God. Now, in the same uh, realm, in the same line of uh, uh, defilement, Jesus goes ahead to actually say what we should wash ourselves from. You get? Uh, you wash your hands. But this is what you should actually wash uh, yourselves from. He starts with evil thoughts. And already these people are already thinking about how to kill Jesus, you know? <laughs> evil thoughts. Then uh, sexual immorality. And these people are already involved in sexual immorality. Wash yourself from theft. Some of these people were really harassing the people and stealing from them. Murder. They were already thinking murderous thoughts. Jesus, Jesus was not the first murder they had committed. Just for you to know. It's, Jesus was not the first person these, lead, these people had killed, you know? Uh, at, you can see the efficiency with which they executed it. They knew how they had. There's a system they knew how to invoke, you know. And then adultery, which is something that was really present amongst the leaders. We don't even talk about greed, malice. Wash yourself from malice. Wash yourself from deceit. Wash yourself, yourself from lewdness. Wash yourself from envy. Uh, cleanse yourself from slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside, and they're the ones that defile a person. So if you're to wash yourself, these are the things you should wash yourself from. Mm. And that's that's fascinating when you think about it. Mm. Looking at um, because Jesus is turning them to the right thing. Because you're washing your hands, but from what? Mm. Just from maybe some dust or something? Or actually they were not even washing their, their hands from because of that. They were washing because that is what they used to do. They did it for the sake of it. But Jesus is saying if you 
you wash yourself, then be clear what you want to wash away from. And these ones don't involve water. These ones involve your heart. Uh, yeah, and, and it's a lot. And actually, because when you read this, it's like the fruit of the Spirit. It's just, Jesus is talking about the fruit of the Spirit uh, versus the fruit of the flesh. Because this is, ends up being, later on in Galatians chapter 5, a major part of the fruit of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And for you to be washed this way, the same one you're questioning, you need him. Yeah. You need Jesus to wash you, not to forgive you from these things. Mm -hmm. And also you need the Holy Spirit of God to begin transforming you and giving you a new stature, uh, a new life, a real cleansing mm -hmm. coming from the Holy Spirit. And uh, fast forward, uh, the same chapter has a fascinating uh, of healing uh, of uh, the, a daughter, a girl, uh, the, the, the famous uh, lady who is uh, Greek, born in Syrian for Phoenicia, and came to beg Jesus to drive a demon out of her daughter. Now this is the infamous uh, passage where Jesus talks about dogs. And verse 28 uh, says, uh, when the lady is pleading uh, with Jesus to, uh, to heal her daughter, says, even the dogs under the table eat the ch children's crumbs. Mm. And let me tell you, David, there's no way of sanitizing this statement. <laughs> you can look at it from left or right, but there's no way of sanitizing What Jesus says here is what he actually said. So let's not say, oh, the dogs are this, oh, uh, he meant this, oh, but this is exactly what he said. But if you look carefully, uh, and it's coming from the response the lady gives, because the lady does not stop there. Mm. She actually accepts yeah. and says uh, and says even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. That's what the lady says. And uh, Jesus oh, earlier on has said it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The woman says even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She almost takes up that identity. And uh, no, she, she actually does take up the identity and said even if you know uh, even if this is what uh, I am, even if this is my what I'm regarded to be, you know, just uh, I still ask you to uh, beg my, there is still something for me, you know, mm. even if it's a cramp, there is still something for me. So what there is for me, you know, let me have it. <laughs> what there is for me, let me have it. And you can see that uh, Jesus in a way was actually saying what the Pharisees and uh, how the teachers of the law would have told this woman. They would have told him, no, 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 no. What we have is ours. You know, you you have nothing. But a cramp, you know, when it comes to a cramp um, from the table of God, mm. is actually essentially the same bread. It <laughs> it's essential. So the crumb has the power of the bread, you know, from which it cracks from. So that there's no small, um, there's no, what you can say, like a fractional power of God. That for you, you are insiders, you get 90%. You outside as you are 90%. Even what is a crumb, it has the power of bread. And so we see uh, the lady being healed there. Then he goes ahead to uh, heal, heal, uh, a man who was deaf and mute. And what stands out for me here is the style, is the form that Jesus takes to heal this man. It's a miracle that is not read often, but it's a, it involves quite a bit. Because after he, first Jesus takes him aside, away from the crowd. That's something that is interesting. Then he puts his fingers into the man's ears. Of course, he was deaf. He does that. Then he spit and touched his spit and touched the man's, the man's tongue. And then he looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, El Fata, you know, or El Fata, meaning be opened. If you look at this miracle, it has so many steps. <laughs> you can count a number of steps. Taking Masai, that's one. Then putting his fingers into the man's ears, number two. Spitting, number three. Touching the man's tongue, number four. Looking up to heaven, number five. With a deep, taking a deep sigh, number six. And speaking, number seven. <laughs> It's a miracle that has seven steps, which is pretty, pretty, um, uh, you know, if when you read into it, you see that God has so many ways of healing. Mm. But what comes out is that whatever way he uses, uh, he desires us to be well. But God does not just have one way. He has so many ways of bringing deliverance and healing. Mm. And you look at um, even the testimonies that we give uh, in church. 
you can hear many many testimonies and the idea is not to say i want to be touched like so and so the idea is i want the one who touched them to touch mm -hmm. me in the way he, he deems it best because um even the way we expect god god meets us in a way that we know it's him mm -hmm. um, i'm looking at like moses and the burning bush i mean he knew how bushes burn I mean, he was in a desert, and these things do happen. And when you look at that bush, you could tell there's something different with that bush. If he came to Nairobi and there was a bush, uh, we would just uh, say, okay, that, there's a bush there that needs a fire extinguisher, and he would just go. So God is also able to meet us in a way we understand, in a way that we, I'm sure this man, it will not be written, but I'm sure this man had confidence in what Jesus was doing. Mm -hmm. There must have been a preparation beforehand uh, about either his situation and how things are going on that I'm in the right hand. Because at one point you would have said, hey, what has he done? He has spat. Now, <laughs> are you sure have you guys, uh, this the guy is doing the right thing, yeah. but you are being prepared. Yeah, just before we go to the uh, chapter 8, there's an, a closing statement there that is fantastic. Um, verse 37, it says, look at the effect uh, that the people were overwhelmed with amazement. I love that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I pray also, especially as a Christian leader, that people would come to church, uh, people would go to a fellowship, people would go to a Christian gathering, and they live overwhelmed with amazement you know because of the work of god you can say wow clearly god has been here and then it says the other line says what they said they said he has done everything well i love that you know and is it that the that what we desire even when I will look at my own life this far since I came to the faith, I can confidently say that indeed Jesus has done everything well through the ups and downs, through my rightness and my wrongness. Clearly, Jesus has handled me very well, you know. Mm -hmm. And at the end of time, this should be our testimony that surely Jesus has done everything well. And allow me to just speak to yes. the, uh, the viewer. And sometimes you wonder what it is that Jesus is going to do in your life. You know, we are suspicious sometimes of what Jesus is going to do. But here it is, right here, that when you receive Jesus Christ in your life, when you allow Jesus in your circumstances, this will be your testimony. You will say, indeed, I am so glad I involved, I invited Jesus because surely I'm amazed because he has done everything well chapter eight wow and um i was just thinking about uh, just the way you're talking about you know salvation and, I'm, I'm, and i was thinking about what i'm saying i do not want to lose the sense of wonder mm. but that sense of wonder should continue because when we have traditions and regulations and rules and denominations and things that we are told to do you can begin to do them like just next 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 and then church is done but I do not want to lose a sense of wonder. Mm. I want to come into church and during praise and worship, I, I, I am amazed at him. And as I hear God's word, I am amazed. The sense of wonder when I hear testimonies. Sometimes even sitting in church, when I see children running up and down and uh, all of that, and I look at them and I say, I'm amazed. And this is what the Lord does. Mm. So the sense of wonder. Chapter 8 continues in the same breath. It continues in the same breath. And it begins with a large crowd gathered. And every time there is a crowd, the tone of Jesus changes. It changes from woe unto you to let's do something good to these guys, you know. <laughs> so this time, he wants to feed them. They are hungry. And he says, if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on their way. So, because they have come a long way. So he has moved with compassion and he's telling the disciples, please feed them. Moved with compassion. What moves us? And I was challenging myself as a, as a pastor. What moves me? Is it the compassion for the crowd or the need I have? Because I could have a need, it could be financial, it could be just appreciation, and uh, I need some fame. So when I look at a crowd, I see fame. You know, when a politician is a crowd, they see votes. Mm. So, but Jesus looked at the crowd and he had compassion, he was moved. And I was saying, maybe be moved by what moves Jesus. Mm. But when you see a crowd, when you see people gathered in church, when you go out for a crusade, when you go out, and you say, oh, I have compassion over them. How, what can I do to make their lives better? And I like the fact that 
that uh, Jesus cared. Mm. First, they are hungry, but they will faint on their way home. We will send them out. And so it's like uh, he is saying, I don't want people to go home. And then uh, what they say are that, yes, we got a lot of word, but we fainted or something bad happened along the way. It's like uh, Jesus is or, or already cares that this, when you come to me, it I have to do everything well, you know, <laughs> such that I will give you this food, but I'll also make sure that you're strong enough to go home and tell the testimony. And that is uh, amazing. You know, I I'm thinking, uh, and you don't have to comment about this, it's just the way sometimes, and I would say, you know, sometimes preachers, uh, and I'm one of them, sometimes you would go to a place and you really want money, and you tell people to give and give, and you know that you have malice in your heart. Mm -hmm. Then people go home, and they have nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. That is not the spirit in this in this text. That is mm -hmm. not. So the miracle done here was done well. Mm -hmm. That's, the way it was done is that there was, there was some left over abundance and for me that is what the word that came to me abundance mm -hmm. that they had they were hungry initially and the, the disciples were actually saying we don't have that kind of money to feed them but after the miracle they were all well satisfied by Jesus but also there was abundance saying that even if we were more, we will still be fed. There is still more for you. Mm -hmm. And every time I invite people to church and to a gathering, even to an online uh, uh, service like this one, I keep on telling them there is abundance in the house of the Lord. There is still leftovers there. There are seven baskets full. When you come in, there are people who are met by different parts of the service. And they will come in and say, wow. And there are people who actually don't follow us on Sunday. But what Wednesday is their thing. Mm -hmm. This is a place of abundance for them. Please go on. There are those again who Sunday service does not do it for them. Word Wednesday well doesn't do it for them. But when we come on Friday there's a faith booster. They are always waiting for it. Mm -hmm. I remember someone who, who wrote a very long text talking about the, the prayer Monday saying that for them what they look forward for in the whole online thing is the prayer Monday. Mm -hmm. They just want to hear someone praying for them passionately. Jesus has abundance for you. Mm -hmm. Just in the house of the Lord there is everything and there are blessings evermore. Mm -hmm. Now even as we continue to move on <clears throat> People come to Jesus and they want a sign. And Jesus asked, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left. And then he said, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. This, this, what Jesus is simply saying is this. Why these guys are asking me to prove something is because somebody has poisoned their mind. Somebody has told them there is no evidence that God exists. There is no evidence that this guy is the son of God. There is no evidence. And this poisoning, this yeast that the, uh, of the Pharisees is everywhere, especially today. People are poisoned. When people come to ask us questions about existence of God, about suffering and uh, why is God good and I'm suffering and all that, and it is not initially their question. Somebody has poisoned their mind and has told them God cannot be good if you are suffering. Has told them what is the evidence that there is creation? What is the evidence that there is this and the other? The church is not a good place. Christians are not good people. We keep on all this poisoning, but Jesus turns them back to what they should be listening to, mm -hmm. which is God's word. It is sufficient. Yeah, yeah and uh, when for Jesus not to give them a sign, you know, when people came for healing, Jesus gave them healing. Mm. Uh, when people came for, those are big things. And Jesus healed. I can't remember anyone who was brought to Jesus and was turned away who needed healing, right? Mm. Uh, and um, even those who needed bread, Jesus still gave them bread. It's just that he put a disclaimer at some point, I know you follow me because of bread, you know? <laughs> but when people ask for a sign, he doesn't give them. You know, mm -hmm. meaning that what Jesus was saying, what Jesus was doing, uh, who Jesus was, was enough. That if you didn't believe what you saw, if you didn't believe what he said, then even a sign wouldn't help you. Uh, dude, actually, he had seen their intentions. 
they were they were not clear intentions they were actually just coming it is more of a test they wanted him to perform magic while he was performing miracles because magic is to prove um, who i say i am i'm a magician whatever but jesus was actually responding to needs when doing a miracle mm. so what is the need here what is the need in this situation what is the desperate situation here nothing these guys just want to come and make him prove something because their minds have been poisoned now miracles again but in a different way jesus you know sometimes we talk about innovation <laughs> and doesn't get to people mm. jesus was that guy that was not performing the same miracle did you just say he was like he was that guy you know he was <laughs> <laughs> you talk about innovation yeah. talk about a guy behind a desk who is inventing a big thing he was that one mm. because the things he's doing are, he's doing them differently and for a purpose because even after he calls you know this woman literally a dog and the only, that is the only place Pharisees did not object. They agreed with Jesus and calling her a dog. <laughs> but after that, he says, there is, I have never seen greater faith than this one even in Israel. So there is always a situation. He's making sure that that statement fits in very well. And they could not say anything else. So look at this. There is this blind man who comes. Then uh, Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes, this one doesn't spit down, he laid hands on him. Then he asked him, do you see everything? Mm. Now see the steps there. Do you see everything? And we see a, a very honest man. He looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. <laughs> so the miracle continues. Then again, he laid his hands upon his eyes and he looked intently and was restored and saw everything clearly. Mm. Two things I picked from this. One is his innovation and the way he did things differently. He's saying you don't have to do it the same way all the time because it is not the method. It is not the method. It is not the, the liturgy that works. It is God that mm. works. Mm. It is not the, the, the method you are using and the procedures and processes. It is he who works. Feel free. If in this situation, this is how we are in an online church, and this is how the situation is, feel free. God will still work in such a way. We could have as well stood on a pulpit and preached about Mark. Beautiful thing. But we do it this way, mm -hmm. as a conversation, mm -hmm. and it still works. It still works. And the second thing I pick from this is the honesty of this, of this guy. He's honest. Because sometimes we feel like we'll offend Jesus by telling him I'm not seeing well. You'll say, but I know I am not well, but I'm hoping to be well. He's saying, I cannot see. You know, sometimes we are we, we have been told to speak positively. You know, think positively, speak positively, don't say a bad thing. But you are ailing, you are sick. It reminds me of a guy I met uh, in a university, in a cult. And this guy was dying of malaria, a treatable disease. And they had prayed and said, have you prayed? Yes, God has said not to heal you through other means. So why don't you try healing through a hospital? Because there's still God's wisdom. And the guy was adamant, we had to take him by force and, and get him treated by uh, malaria. And he was saying, I'm not sick. I cannot be sick. I, and I'm telling him, he said he will heal our diseases. Mm -hmm. That means we'll get sick. It is within his statement. So this guy says the truth. And so even as you, as you, as you come to a conclusion, the idea is Jesus, you will not bother Jesus by telling him, I am not well. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, I am not well. I'm supposed to be well, but I'm not well. And earlier on, is somewhere we are speaking about the issue of um, mourning. People expect you to move on very fast. Mm -hmm. And so you feel bad when you keep on posting the person who passed on. You talk about your, the loved one who passed on, and you feel a bit guilty. They make you feel guilty. They tell you, no, let them rest in peace. Move on. This fellow did not move on. This guy told Jesus, I'm actually not well. <laughs> you, are, you know, I, I'm just trying to imagine also, um, well, if uh, this is Jesus you're talking about, <laughs> he's done those several steps that you've talked about, and then uh, you tell Jesus, I, Jesus, 
this time uh, everything has not worked very well <laughs> <laughs> you know and you can imagine if you if you're talking about to, to an insecure person and then uh, you'd be like hey you know what's going on here you know but i believe that when jesus was asking him this question he already want what he was looking for is exactly the honesty of this person mm. and that's exactly when you this the type of a man that god really wants to make us mm. no don't don't pretend you know you know <laughs> where you do not know just say you do not know and also he's telling us um, uh, about uh, uh, the, the, the the perfection of his of his work yeah. that some now you see like a dim image in a mirror yeah. but a time will come when you shall see clearly you know yeah. and uh, that god does not also come into your life to leave you seeing things unclearly like people are trees and trees are people no 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 god comes so that he can handle and leave you in a place where you can say i was blind but now i see not i was blind but now i can see ish you know <laughs> and it's no wonder when he cleanses us he cleanses us to the whiteness of wool you know and that is the 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 the, 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 uh, the will of god in our lives that's the action of god in our lives to do things really well to do things absolutely well and that's that's such an amazing uh, miracle there <coughs> Now, again, Jesus asked the question, who do men say I am? Mm. And it's not out of insecurity. He's just, <laughs> the disciples are actually beginning to catch up. was looking for some fans. <laughs> some, some guy to say, they think you are great. <laughs> he, he's, uh, you know, politicians sometimes carry psycho fans around. Mm. Them, you, are, you are the greatest. Everyone is speaking about you. Jesus is asking generally, are people getting it? Or are you, you, know, are you guys also getting it? Mm. And they give him several examples, but Peter answered, you are the Christ. Now, for, there's a lot you can say about that, but I want to connect it to another verse here, where Peter hears that Jesus is about to die, and, and, and he says, Peter took him aside and rebuked him, and said, you can't die. Now, Peter is saying you are the Christ. Sometimes he knows, sometimes he doesn't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we beat ourselves too much. Especially if we are Peter. We are the guy who is supposed to be the main guy. You get it right in several things, but you are not Jesus. You cannot do everything well. There are things you do not know. Peter is actually told, get behind me, Satan. The fellow who was told, hey, Peter, this must have been God speaking to you. And this time, this is the devil speaking to you. <laughs> the same Peter. Mm -hmm. So forgive yourself, lady. Because sometimes you, you can't get it right all the time. It is Jesus that gets right all the time. Stop having the burden of being Jesus. Just be with Jesus, mm -hmm. but don't have the burden of being Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, the final thought here that I want to pick is what a question that Jesus gives. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world mm -hmm. and for faith his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. For what does it profit a man? He has now, he is cutting to the chase. He's saying, now you have seen miracles, you have seen bread and abundance, you have seen all these things, but that is what I actually came to do. I came to give you life. Who does it profit a man to gain all this and not have life? For the first time, we have had billionaires and millionaires say, when they got COVID, they realized their money can't help them. For the first time, <coughs> we queued in public hospitals. For the first time, we are having the same vaccine. For the first time, we are using masks. For the first time, and no one is exempt. Jesus is saying that the most important thing is that you have life in him, that you inherit the kingdom of God, and do not be shy about it. Because sometimes we are shy because we are looking forward for some favors. Mm. We, we don't want to lose members lest our salaries are, are curtailed and all that. We are afraid, but Jesus wasn't. But he says, the most important thing for you is to have life in him and do not be ashamed of him. So make this statement to us, who again, who are following us, that if you have not received him as your personal savior, mm. you are missing it. 
You may think it is because you want to cut a few corrupt deals and be rich. You may think it's because you want to live a promiscuous life and have that, that life out there that you think it's fun. But losing your life, there's nothing you can pay that you may have that life Jesus gives. Only Jesus can give it to us. And for you who is born again, do not be shy. Keep talking about this life, this eternal life, that is a life of abundance. May the Lord bless you. Amazing. And that's a great, great you know, chapter right there. And uh, I mean, God is just putting things in the right order for you and for me. Let's prioritize life uh, because you can lose it. And you lose it by putting yourself in a certain mold like you want you are chasing chasing particular things and you think they'll bring life to you but jesus tells you i mean doesn't benefit to gain the whole world and then you lose your own soul and god is telling you and me what the right priority of the right order of things is life fast other things follow and seek fast the kingdom of god and his righteousness and these other things you know will follow these other things will be given to you so prioritize your life secure it here and secure it in the life after and the way to do it is to really honestly just say i have not been all right i really need the help of god and just say lord i have been living my life it's messed up it's not good sometimes the closest i come is to seeing people like trees but god is saying i will make things clear for you i will make your life one that you can see things clearly and if you want to see things clearly my sister my brother this is the time for you to choose life first these are the things will follow and of course don't be ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ because sometimes you go to places it may be in a workplace and you show up as a christian and people are like oh you still believe those things i mean i thought you were clever i mean all of a sudden it's like once you say you believe in Jesus it's like the sheer you know the sheer value goes down you know but it goes down in the eyes of men but in the eyes of God where it really matters in the eyes of God where life lies your share is intact therefore just choose whom it is that you'd want to please to please the people who think you'll be foolish or to think uh, or to or to please the God uh, who has redeemed you from what you and I know was foolishness. So may God help us. And I want to invite you to commit your life to Jesus Christ. If you have not done that, this is a wonderful time. Say this prayer after me. Loving God, I come to you knowing that I'm needy and things have not been clear in my life. But I'm glad to know that you have promised to make things clear and therefore make things clear for me and i give my life to you to be my shepherd i give my life to you to be my priority i give my life to you that what it is you do to those who trust in you i shall be able to experience and if you have prayed this prayer, just know that Jesus Christ has come into your life and you're just about to begin your, actually you've just begun your brand new life. Just write to us, tell us your name and give us your contact. We'll get back to, we'll get in touch with you. And if uh, uh, you do not do that, get in touch with uh, Christians who are around you, go to a church that is nearby you and begin to walk this life, the life of abundance, the life of seeing things clearly, and we pray and believe that God is going to do all things well to your amazement, to the glory of God, and to your joy in Jesus' name. Again, this has been Word Wednesday. Thank you for watching.